ask um, KB to open uh, the session with a word of prayer. Then I will brief more. Then I'll hand over to the pastor. KB, may you pray for us. Hello. Um, yeah, maybe he's unable to, maybe we want to ask yeah, maybe he's All right. Um, Sorry, was I on mute? Yes, you were. Yes, you, you're on mute. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know. Should I pray again? Sorry. Please. I think that that will be all fine. Okay. Uh, shall we close our eyes for prayer? Thank you, Father in heaven, for this time that we can come and learn from you. Thank you for your Sabbath day. We ask that as we start uh, the lesson this afternoon, you might be with us. Open our hearts, open our minds, and we pray for those who are still to join. May you be with us. May you continue to direct our paths. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, KB, for the prayer. Um, as I've already said, um, Alluded our theme for um, personal ministries for this weekend was uh, is um, the Lord is quiet. Uh, Pastor Balasi has uh, taken us through um, quite a number of interesting um, things that he has highlighted to us when it comes to um, the theme that we have. Um, one of the key things that I have uh, uh, picked on our um, during uh, the last two sessions is, uh, um, in most instances, God is not, He is not quiet. He is present in our lives, and uh, sometimes an issue of uh, um, that uh, um, He does come to us. He is responding to our prayers. He is responding to our um, request. But sometimes it's the way that uh, this uh, is responding to um, our prayers or requests that uh, we are not really comfortable with us, that are not, we are not comfortable with. And in that case, sometimes we end up thinking that God is quiet in our lives and yet he is communicating, he's engaging with, with, with us. And also there are issues that he has uh, highlighted in terms of uh, when it comes to faith, that um, faith is key in the things that we, that we do. There are some that are moved by miracles where their lives is transformed because of um, the, uh, the miracles that would have happened in their lives. And uh, they start growing their faith. Then there are instances for us as Christians where regardless of what's happening in our, uh, our lives, the thing that drives us uh, and makes us continue having uh, uh, leaning on God is the faith, regardless of what, what will be happening. And to help us continue unpacking uh, um, some of the uh, uh, key issues or maybe uh, areas that we have concerns when it comes to uh, the issue of uh, the things that will be happening to us, where as a church or as a, at individual level, we will be asking ourselves, where is God in all these things? Like for instance, we are going through Corona. There's a lot that has happened. And sometimes as a, um, as a church, we'll be praying to God that can you intervene so that this thing disappears. And this doesn't only ap uh, apply to the pandemic that, uh, uh, that is uh, affected to the world. There are things that are, are happening in our lives. Some are looking for jobs. They have been looking for, for a very long time. Some, they have got issues maybe with kids some they are, they are sick and you have been praying you've been fasting and in all of this you're just asking yourself where is god he is he seems to be silent so pastor balosi would help us to unpack some of those things and also i think i would encourage the church that we participate we have got different experiences that we have gone through in our lives that sometimes there are periods where we thought that god was uh, silent in our lives but when we reflect now when we look in retrospect to um, those periods that we thought you was, uh, was, was silent. Can we really say you were silent or maybe they had greater plans for our, 
from uh, for our lives. So these are some of the things that I would encourage us as from a personal experience that we share so that we grow our faith. Thank you. Uh, I'll hand over to Pastor Balosi to uh, continue with the, with the program. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Terence. Let me just um, switch on my video again. Okay. Um, so thank you so much, guys, for inviting me. Again, for having me this afternoon, just for us to have this discussion. Um, to, to well, maybe to expand on some of the thoughts uh, that we shared on the sermons and also to maybe share new ones um, this afternoon. And I think at the heart of the theme, which is God is not silent, which as I said, um, is actually an attempt to try and motivate, revive and encourage us that the, the continuation of of our discomfort, the, the continuation of our suffering is not an indication of God's indifference or God being silent or God not caring about what's going on. But in actual fact, and uh, through various uh, methods uh, and in various ways, I've um, tried to show that what we deem God's silence is actually misunderstanding God, what God is currently doing. <laughs> Excuse me. So when we say he's silent, what we mean is that he's not doing what we anticipate and what we expect him to do. Um, and then therefore he's, he must be quiet. And I always like to refer back to the story of the three Hebrew boys. And I, 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 I don't like to read myself into a favorable position whenever I read a text. So I don't like to read myself as the three Hebrew boys in the text. I'm, most times than not, I think I would be part of Nebuchadnezzar's cabal, maybe one of the guys that was sent to throw the boys in, because I don't have a Cinderella approach or a Disney princess approach to scripture, where I always assume that scripture is written with me um, or in, the, in, a, in a good and favorable position. Um, and I always find that it's enlightening when, you, when I read the text like that, when I don't read it as the three Hebrew boys, but I read it as one of the Babylonians, and I don't read it as the Hebrews, but I read it as, as an, Egypt, an Egyptian you find that the text tends to be more illuminating and more challenging uh, when you remove yourself um, from a position of being the darling of the text. Um, so, so, so I digress though. So in reading the story of the three Hebrews in light of suffering and in light of us being intimidated by God's silence, when we go into a situation like that, which is, which is what always happens is that we always see our situations uh, you know, being lit up seven times harder than normal. You know, it goes from level one to level two, level three. It, it, it keeps increasing in degrees. Our persecution, our challenges keep increasing in degrees. And at each and every single level of increase, God doesn't seem to be acting, doesn't seem to be reducing it. He doesn't seem to be interested in um, making it stop. Um, and so we then begin to pray prescriptively to God which is not what the Hebrew boys did. I mean, they let go of that, that thought and that thinking that they can prescribe to God what should be done in that situation. I mean, the fact that they are in that situation is a sign of their vulnerability. It is a sign of their weakness and frailty, right? So you can't be in a condition and still know how to get yourself out of that condition. The fact that you are in that condition means that you don't have the capacity, one, to keep yourself away from that situation, but also to, to get yourself out of it. And that's why you then surrender the situation and yourself to someone greater than you to get you out of that situation, which is God. Now, it doesn't make sense. It always behooves me when people who are in that situation then also invite God to their, to their situation and then proceed to advise God on how to get them out of a situation they couldn't prevent themselves from getting into in the first place. But what the Hebrew boys do is that they then say, no, our God is able. And that's what they rely on. And that's what they depend on God's ability to rescue them. As to how he will do it is not something that they bother themselves with. Because as I will highlight now, that is one of the things that causes frustration. And I've got about four things that cause us frustration and vex us 
when we're going through challenges and the way we find ourselves asking the question, where is God when he does? Why is God quiet? There are four things. And one of, the, one of those things is that it's because we prescribe to God what needs to happen. And when God doesn't follow the pattern of our prescription, then we get frustrated. What frustrates us though, is not that God is inactive, but it's the fact that God is not following our prescribed method of rescuing us. So this boy said, our God is able, right? Even if he doesn't, we're still not gonna bow down. And that's again, a sermon for another day that the choice is not that, that, that what they're saying there is not we're not choosing god because of what he can do we're choosing him of who he is because of who he is or vice versa we're not rejecting your statue because god um because of what god does for us but we're rejecting your statue because it is inferior to who god is even when god chooses not to act he's still a superior choice than the statue you have created. So we're not gonna bow down to the statue because even an inactive God, even a, 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 a God who chooses not to do anything is still a more powerful God than your statue because he's a God who can choose. And part of his choosing is choosing not to rescue us. And so for that reason, we'll continue to worship him because he's a better God than the statue you're offering us. So, so they leave this, the, the idea, the they don't leave, they leave the prescriptions uh, to God, how God rescues them. It's not going to be up to them. They're not going to tell God how they need to be rescued, whether they're going to be rescued by a million rand tender, or they're going to be rescued by a promotion, or they're going to be rescued by marrying a certain type of wife or a certain type of husband, or they're going to be rescued by uh, you know, acquiring a certain education. That's what frustrates us, that we think what will rescue us from our circumstances and from our situations is what we have thought um, is essential and is indispensable to, to, to our lives. Uh, whereas God can do the same thing without necessarily relying on what you have thought of and prescribed to him. So if you want to stop being frustrated by what you're going through, right, the first thing that you need to let go of is this idea of prescriptions. And I entitled it, uh, well, I title it entitlement, this entitlement that you can prescribe to God what he needs to do and that you are entitled to getting what you are prescribing to God, right? That entitlement aspect needs to be, needs to go. And, and, and almost like the Hebrew boys, um, uh, you know, sort of allow yourself to, to, and surrender yourself to God, to God, to God's ability and not limited to how you think God can function. So you surrender yourself to God being able and how God decides to choose that he decides to, uh, to display his ability is nothing that is not something that involves you or includes you. And by the way, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let, let me just maybe give you the four things that I'm gonna talk about today. And I've already started on the entitlement and which includes prescriptions as one is the things that intimidate us and the things that worry us, bother us, and unsettle us about our circumstances and about our challenges and about our suffering, or rather, let me say what causes us suffering um, is one, the duration of the persecution or the duration of the challenge, or two, its rationality, what when you rationalize about it, that in rationalizing about certain things, we lose sight of the supernatural aspect of things, and I'll get into that just now, and how that is self-defeating in of itself. When you when you divorce yourself from the fact that your faith in, includes in it and inside of it. Um, and in fact, the purpose of faith is to, is to help us uh, not understand, but to help us um, appropriate and discern the supernatural. That's what faith does. When reason fails and rationality fails, then faith takes over, uh, which is operating outside the realm of rationality and reason and into the realm of the supernatural. And because we are so rational in our faith, we lose sight of this of the supernatural aspect. And I'll share that with you. And then of course, I've already started on the entitlement aspect. And then the last one is intimidation. Uh, being intimidated um, by the fact that if, if this thing is here and it looks so big, then it's going to consume us. It looks like it's going to finish us. And we get we get so consumed by what we are going through that we are don't we are not able to discern the one who is going through it with us. So we are more focused on what's happening than uh, the one in whose presence it is happening. I hope that uh, that makes sense. That makes sense. Just a, um, just a question from this. Yeah. Uh, can you can you rehash the things you said? Um, the pres we are want to prescribe to God, and then okay. is it the duration and uh, oh, I didn't yeah. get the two. So it's duration. Yeah, duration, rationality, and, rationalizing things, and losing yeah. sight of the supernatural, and then okay. it's entitlement, which is prescription, 
right? And then yeah. the last one is intimidation, which is the last okay. one that I spoke about. Yeah. Thanks for that. Right, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, yeah. No. Thanks. Th thanks for that, uh, Elder M. Um, because then I'm 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 able to then see that at least that I'm talking to people and not to myself. And just stop me if you think I'm going too fast or I'm, you there's something <laughs> okay. that you can get. Just stop me. Yeah. Right. So then I, I, I've right. already started on sure, the entitlement one, the, the prescription with the three Hebrew boys, right? Um, and by the way, right, we, we, and, and maybe this will also help us to segue nicely into the rationality aspect of, of what frustrates us. So it's, it's this idea that, you know, when the Hebrew boys are persecuted, we know that this is a supernatural event. And I want to give you another illustration. When, when, when these Hebrew boys are, so, are, are, are persecuted, they're not persecuted it's not a challenge to who they are. It's not a. It's not a. It's not personal, as we like to say. It's not personal. It's a king who throws out a challenge to God and says, "I'm going to throw you into the fire. And I want to see who's going to rescue you from my hand." That's the challenge. I want to see who's going to deliver you from my hand. So they they might be the pawns, and they might be the ones that experience the persecutions. They're the ones that are thrown into the fire, but they are simply. Um, they're simply. They're simply tokens, right? Uh, and 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 a desperate attempt. Their persecution is a desperate attempt to get to God. It's not about them. It's about someone trying to prove that no God is able to take them out of their hand. So he throws them into the fire to challenge a God who will dare say, I can take them out of your hand. So you understand that even their persecution is not about them. It's about it's about a challenge to their God, right? And so when they when they when and 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 that's why then they say you know what, we don't have a problem with this. This is an issue about God. It's your, it's your problem with God. It's not our problem with God. So we don't have a problem with you, actually, because that is a result of your problem. You may live forever, O king. They literally say that. They bless him uh, just before he throws them into the fire and say, our God is able. In other words, the challenge you're throwing out will be answered by God as to how he chooses to do that is not entirely up to us. So then they get thrown into the fire, and, of course, God delivers them. Uh, and when we when we so, so that's that's the the entitlement aspect that we they don't prescribe to God how it should be done or how God should do it and so forth. But when they are in the fire again, because they're not operating with rationality and they're operating in faith, right? They are always open to the idea on the possibility of the supernatural happening. So faith doesn't demand the supernatural, but faith is always sensitive to the possibility that the supernatural can happen and that the supernatural is about to take place. So faith doesn't bring about the supernatural. I hope you're, you're hearing me, but faith is thus, it gives us insight into the supernatural when it happens, right? Because the supernatural confounds the rationality. Now, let me show you how this works. If again, in that same story, these boys are thrown into the fire, it's lit up seven times harder than normal rationality says let me seek for a solution that makes sense in this moment right and what solution makes sense in this moment god um you know even in when we include what we would, would assume as supernatural it is always within the confines of rationality it must make sense so when we say at that moment what makes sense in this moment if god can send thunder to strike these guys down or send an army a foreign army to attack this these guys before they throw us into the fire or if god can send like just torrential rains to wet the logs and to and to and to put out the fire if god doesn't do that then he must send wind to blow out the fire you know although in some instances as you know that the wind actually makes the fire even worse so rationality says let me prescribe to god see rationality married with entitlement produces disappointment um, and also blinds you there. I hope you're hearing me. And, and it blinds you to the possibility of the supernatural. So when you've got rationality married to entitlement, you are blinded to the supernatural. So if God can't do it like this, then you're not able to see him do what he has chosen to do, right? Um, and so when he doesn't send the rain, the clouds don't gather, you get frustrated, you get scared. When all of a sudden, uh, the wind doesn't gather, you get scared. When there are no armies that come to attack your enemies, you get scared. And because you are out of options, you then start to believe that God is also out of options. And that's the, these are some of the things that frustrate us. For example, if you are owing, uh, I don't know, if you've got debts, um, you always believe that the one way to pay for your debt is as far as you're able to earn a salary. And then COVID comes around and your salary is reduced. All of a sudden, your ability to meet your debts, right, which were 
I don't know, taken out responsibly and in light of how much you earn, right? And all of a sudden you can't meet those commitments anymore because your salary has been reduced. It's an inexplicable event. You had no idea that it would happen and it would take place. Um, so you now it, your, your salary is reduced. So what do you do when you then, for, to find a way out, you then start praying to God to ensure, to ask him to please uh, assist your employer to return your salary back to normalcy, right? That's rational, that's a rational prayer. But the supernatural could actually lead to a, 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 an, an endless uh, list of possible solutions to that problem, right? Uh, your debtors could write off your debt and understand that things are hard, things are tough, and so they decide to write it off because they've insured, they've insured theirs, which is something that never and hardly ever happens, that they sympathize with you and decide to relieve you of your debt. You could find that um, God gives you other streams of income and so forth and so forth. So my point is, in being rational and in being entitled to how God operates, we actually limit not only how God operates, but we limit ourselves to perceiving and to seeing how God operates and how God works and how God has chosen to deliver us. And look at this in the story of the three Hebrew boys. He doesn't send rain, he doesn't send wind, he doesn't send any armies, he doesn't send any rational situation, but instead he allows them to be thrown into the fire and saves them in the fire. That is inexplicable because we have never thought of fire as an incubator and, and as a place of safety from those who are trying to destroy us. So they make the fire, throw us into the fire, only for God to use the fire to protect us, for, to protect us from further harm from their hands, right? So they made the fire, they've thrown us into the fire, and then God uses the fire to insulate and incubate us so that we are not harmed further. By them. them. Does it make sense? I hope, I, I hope you're saying amen there with your muted mics in the background there. So that's amen. what happens when so that's what happens when, when we let go of this idea of being rational, you know, uh, of feeling entitled to how God operates. Uh, we are we, we open ourselves up to possible endless possibilities of how God can deliver us, that God doesn't need rational situation solutions always, doesn't need solutions that make sense always. To deliver us. And let me say this, because we have bought into this colonial Western, Euro-Western idea of Christianity and, and faith that is always rational and always is looking to make sense, we have shut ourselves off to the realm of, of the supernatural. We've shut ourselves off to the possibilities of the impossible, right? Uh, that in God, the impossible is very possible, no matter how much no matter how senseless it is and no matter how much it confounds our ability to rationalize it. So, and because, because we are bought into this idea of this Euro-Western idea of, 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 of rational faith, that it must make sense before. For example, Elder Mashidin, if I was to say to you, God told me to tell you, <laughs> right? Just that one statement, God told me to tell you. Already from there, I've aroused a suspicious, uh, a sus a, a, whatever, I've aroused your suspicion, and I've, you, you immediately put up your guard. And the question that you ask is, why couldn't God come tell me? See, it doesn't make sense that God will send a message that he can send to me via you. Mm. What am I looking for? Mm. Sense. I'm looking for ration, the ration, yeah. rationality of it. But with this rationality <clears throat> also comes what I call individualistic piety, that if God can send you, he can also send me. What makes you better than me, right? Because I'm also <laughs> as pious as you are. I'm also as pietistic yeah. as you are. I'm also as holy as you are. So why can't God say, why must God send you to me? And because of this individualistic piety, we divorce ourselves from the from 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 this biblical notion of faith within community that God will not always send your solutions directly to you, but he will use others to help you. Right? because we are a community of faith. So this individualistic, rational um, uh, uh, approach to faith then isolates us, but not only isolates us, it makes us feel like we are better than, and therefore, because we are better than, we cannot receive help from others. And we, so because some of the help that God will send our way will come from people we think are less than us, we are never able to receive it and to accept it because it doesn't come from places we deem, we think that God would deem worthy of using. I hope that makes, that makes, that makes sense. So we are, so we are, we're not just are we allowed to ask questions? Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Ever. Well, we have to wait on until you said. are done. Yeah. Yeah, on what you said already. <clears throat> yeah. On what you just said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. Look, I've got a a question. 
uh, and it goes like this. Mm. Our lives, especially in Jovek, mm. we, the time, there's always time pressure mm. to this, this pressure of time uh, around our obstacles. Mm. So I owe someone and something has happened to me and, uh, and, and because of time pressure, when I pray, I, mm. I sort of first think of the promises that God has made. He says, mm. call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. Mm. And that in itself sort of gives me uh, some level of entitlement to mm. say the, the promise has been made. First, it says, if I, I return my tithe, I'll be okay. I do that. And then mm. it says, when you pray, I will, I, will, I will deliver you. And then it says, fear not, for I'm with you. Uh, let not your hearts be troubled. Ne? But there's a, there's a date that is coming. Um, <laughs> you know, for thrillers, I'm not saying I'm watching thrillers, but you know, there's always mm. something happening behind the scenes and you, mm. you, you want a solution to be provided before the, the, the thing happens. It's just human mm. nature. Yeah. So, why shouldn't I feel some level of entitlement to, to some extent uh, to say I have a situation for which I have prayed and I then believe that it will be resolved instead of waiting 38 years for it to be resolved? All right. I'm not prescribing how, but I'm just saying it must be resolved somehow. Yeah. So then you know we, we, we're getting into what i call the duration or intimidation uh, aspect of, of what um frustrates us a, a little bit here and maybe we can just mesh them all together and 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 see what we come up with you don't you don't always have to be systematic in your presentations uh, sometimes the spirit must lead um so one in you so with that question and i and i get that a lot um and of course i also struggle with that a lot the idea of time pressure but then i also then read this you know the bible and and i and i and granted the bible is not there as a promise right that god will do what you read him to be doing in scripture but it is an advert of what god can do right that god is an involved god he's a god who gets involved he's a god who delivers he's a god who does things for his people and so he might not necessarily shut the mouths of lions like it for me like it did for daniel because i may never get thrown into into a lion's den but then the question is what is my den what is my hopeless situation um that god that i that god is not irrelevant in getting involved in so when i read the scripture then i i i i also have or find those um those 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 same uh sort of sort of sort of um questions secondly um the idea of entitlement, right, is so when we feel that, and what makes us suffer, and let me start with this, yeah, that, because I, I prepared it in my head. When we, so what, what makes us suffer is not necessarily what we're going through, but what we make of it, right? So that's what causes us to suffer. It's not necessarily what we're going through, but what we make of it. For example, um, I suffer when um, I've got a lower back pain. That makes me, that's so why I even look for painkillers to stop it. But then when I'm on a bicycle, that kind of suffering <laughs> is different. I enjoy it. In fact, when you make me stop, you know, suffering on the bike, then you, I actually suffer some more from being, uh, from being stopped to suffer on the bike. So what makes us suffer is not necessarily what is, it's not the pain that we're experiencing, but what we make of the pain that we're experiencing. And of course, there's a whole lot uh, behind that. And so when I, when I, when I, the reason why I'm saying we need to question this idea of entitlement is one are you really entitled to what god can do or do you receive it gratuitously gratuitously now there is a question here Ed, that, that says so if i'm a child of the king why can't i be entitled to what the king does that and that's and that's precisely the point is that you're never entitled to what the king does you are 
you, it is given to you as a gift. In fact, even your being a child of the king is given, is bestowed upon you. It's not something you're entitled to, it's given to you. It's something that the king bestows upon you, hands out to you generously uh, in mercy and in grace, right? So even if even your position or your disposition as a child of the king is bestowed upon you as an act of grace, and therefore whatever you receive from the king is an act of grace, right? Um, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you another, another, another thought here. Right. So, so when we, when we, when we ask the king, right, of what we are in, we feel we're entitled to, right, there's another problem there that we, we always ask the king less than what he has prepared for us. Whenever we feel we're entitled to something and ask God for something that we think we're entitled to, you'll find more times than not that what he's prepared for us is markedly superior to what we request of him. And I make the, the example of the story of the, of the young son when he goes back home. He feels, he's in, he feels that he can get away with convincing his father that he's remorseful and that he's sorry for having uh, you know, squandered his living. Then he says, make me as one of your servants. But the father never has that in mind. He never sees him as anything less than his son. And so when the boy asks for servanthood or slavery, the father restores him to being a son. And that for me is always, is, is a mark and it's symptomatic, right? It's, it's a symptomatic, it's symptomatic of our, of our inability to always ask of God what he has got in store for us, right? So that's, 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 that's where the, the idea, the entitlement idea comes from, that let go of the entitlement and let God be God. Let him continue bestowing upon you what he has decided to bestow upon you at a time that he has chosen, simply because the time and the solution, if it comes from God, is always going to be much better than what you have prescribed, right? And of course, we've got ample examples of how God does not respect time precious right even even unto dire consequences and he doesn't respect those time constraints but when he arrives in the scene right it's almost as if he has arrived at the right time though we have always seen it as him being late um, of course I, mean, I don't want to talk about Lazarus at this at this time that even though it seems as though God is late when he does finally arrive on the scene and delivers a solution right he doesn't only deal with what is wrong but he also deals with the consequences of his delay all right and so and so for me yeah so then let me not even say for me when I read the Bible and I and I and I and I, and I, and I try and answer this question of God God's timing, um, versus my prescriptions, God's interventions versus versus my entitlement. It always seems as though whenever my pattern is followed, if my pattern was to be followed, and of course this is always in hindsight, if my pattern was always going to be followed, I was always going to get less than what God was prepared to give me. And this is always in hindsight when I see when God absolutely defies my time frames, absolutely denies my prescriptions, right? And he delivers what he's always what what he's always planned to do. Then I suddenly realize, oh, that's why he had to say no. What he had planned was always better than what I prescribed to him. And 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 again, this is. Uh, let me just get into this duration idea again, uh, Mashinin, is that we feel right, and uh, that the longer the solution, I mean, the longer the problem lasts the more of a norm it becomes. And the more of a norm it becomes, the harder it will be to undo it and to reverse it. It causes so much damage. It's gonna be difficult for God to undo it and to reverse it, right? And so, it, but it seems as though God does not have a respect, doesn't have respect for the duration of the problem and of the challenge. What intimidates us is that the longer it lasts, the harder it's gonna to be to reverse it or the harder it's gonna to be to undo it excuse me, and if, if it lasts for long, then it's gonna you know, spiral out of control. And that's precisely it, that it's only ever out of our own control and never out of God's control, no matter how long it lasts. That's why then when he gets into that um, you know, environment of this man who's been sick for 38 years, it doesn't take him 38 years to heal this man. It's only a momentary thing. That you know why? Because the duration of the problem is not necessarily indicative of how much is going to be required of God in order to deal with this problem. So at some point, right? And I like the honesty in the question. We're going to have to distinguish between our frustrations, our panic, our you know insecurities uh, in challenges, 
and who we believe and we deem God to be. Do we allow God to be God in our situations or do we force him and demand of him to conform to our insecurities? Because asking him and demanding him to be on time really is informed by our insecurity and him being on time indeed is about, is about, is about getting him to conform to our insecurity. And so, yeah, that's, that's, that, that's, that's, that's the long uh, answer uh, to, that, to that question. And so another one here, uh, I found that it leads me down a legalistic path where I look at God's provision as a reward for conforming. Yeah, um, again, you know, yo, this, this is where this idea of entitlement again, like just keeps expanding. You're quite right. Uh, who's, who sent that? Um, uh, Ivan, yes, you're quite right, Ivan, that there's also there's also this in, in this entitlement thing. There's this all oh, this this legalistic idea of how God should operate. Because I wake up at twelve, and because <laughs> I'm going to get into trouble here. Because I pray at a certain time, and I pray at a certain number of times, and I deny myself certain things, I then also feel entitled that then God must reward me for my efforts in asking Him to do this thing for me. So I ask Him to do it, but then uh, I feel entitled to Him doing it for me because of how what I did. In asking him to do it for me, and and there's this idea and this disappointment that envelops us and that overwhelms us when God doesn't seem to respond to our, our machinations and our what I call sometimes they because they do take on the form of manipulation where we manipulate God to acting on our behalf faster than we would. So it's all it's all part of desperation. And for me, more than just understanding what God plans to do what God intends to do. There's also a responsibility on our part to interrogate our motives, to interrogate our feelings, to interrogate our insecurities and the insecure nature of our faith, because that's where growth comes from, by the way. It doesn't come from God delivering the solutions to us, as I said in, the, in one of the sermons. It doesn't come from God delivering these grand miraculous rescues for us. It comes from reflecting on on our insecurity. Um, why do we feel that God needs to do this now and at, in this particular way? What does it affirm in us? What does it, uh, what does it, what, what do we hope um, it will do for our faith, right? And why is it that our faith will only benefit from God doing things in a particular way that we have prescribed to him and not how he has chosen? So there's a need for us also to just step back a little bit and reflect on this, okay, I, I want this and I want it to be done by this particular time, but why am I so adamant about this? I hope I've answered your questions, gentlemen. Hello? Um, yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, mm. Yeah, no, I think you can continue. Um, okay. But just one little thing there. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the issue of faith. Yeah. So, I don't know if a faith is, when you talk about faith, I don't know if we're just talking about the presence of it or the amount of it. So, so that if, if I do not get the intervention, mm. then my faith diminishes because I, next time I pray for something else, because the other one didn't go my way, <laughs> then my, my faith, in my prayer, my confidence, rather, maybe. The faith, let's say faith remains there, but the mm -hmm. confidence that goes with my prayer is sort of butchered somehow. It's, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's no longer at the same level as it was before, just using the two instances. Right. Um, so so how, do we, how do we keep the faith for 38 mm. years while you're not getting the results that mm. you seek for? So going back to that uh, gentleman for 38 years, for him, it was clear. It was a misplaced faith, as you said, mm -hmm. in the morning. But he, he actually saw that if I can just jump into that, I, I will be fine. So whenever he misses it, however frequent it was happening, there was this chance of saying, one of these days, someone's going to push me into that. Yeah, one. So yeah. now for me, there's no pool. It's only my, my, my faith and my God who can resolve my issues. And I'm, I'm in a painful situation and I'm praying and I quote scripture. Mm. 
and, uh, and nothing is happening. And, and mm. also the, the way life is, it's not like it's going to be kinder to me because I've got one issue. It's going to add another mm. issue and another one. Yeah, one. So, so yeah. then as I pray, now, now I'm just thinking about a person who's praying, what happens to their faith at this time? Mm. Is, it, is it diminishing? Is it diminishing? And, 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 and isn't God now supposed to be actually saying, hey, I don't want this guy to, to lose his faith. I need mm. to sort of <laughs> come in at some stage, yeah, whenever that yeah. is. You know, yeah, and, 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 and thank you for, for, for those questions. And, and um, I'm, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak, I'm not gonna be like abstract in this. This is like, um, you know, uh, talking in practical, but also experiential terms and not just like abstract things, you know, saying nice sounding things <laughs> so that we can say, yo, 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 God is powerful after this, but it hasn't helped us in any way. Um, so one, um, let me just start with the story of this man. Um, so, and I'm glad you brought it up. So that man is not saved because of his faith, but he's sa he saved in spite of his faith. And that's precisely why we can't be entitled. And that's why I'm, I'm dealing with this entitlement issue. It is because our, in, our faith and understanding of God is usually so misplaced that it doesn't warrant a response from God. But God usually responds favorably to us in spite of our misplaced and wrong faith and wrong understanding of who he is and you know how we should act. So we are not saved. We are not delivered because of our faith. Most of the time we are delivered in spite of our faith, right? And so God responds to something that he should, he should actually ignore. Um, and so that um, on its own is actually like a sign of just, you know, how merciful God is that um, he actually goes in, helps us when we place our faith in those superstitions and in these traditions and he still helps us uh, to be able to walk and deliver us from our infirmities, right? So that's, 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 that's the first one. And then the second one is that the miracles, and I've, I've got like a whole sermon on this, um, on just the miracles, idea of miracles, and how miracles do, are not for people with faith. They're not committed or they're not performed by people of faith for, for themselves. While you do get people who have faith performing miracles, it's always for others. Peter and John at the temple, they raise, they raise the man who was laying in the book of Acts in the name of Jesus. Uh, so the miracle, they had faith, but the miracle is performed for him. Why? Because those who have faith don't need miracles to build up their faith, right? And miracles are exactly that for that, precisely for that, to build up their miracles. And so when your faith wanes and when your confidence in God wanes, that's when I think you arrive for a miracle, but not because you have faith, but so that precisely because your faith is weakened. And that's why Jesus would say, every time he's performed a miracle, I did these things so that you may believe, right? So where there's unbelief, these things do happen. And where there is belief, it's the word of God that takes place, the name that of God that keeps, that keeps God's people, um, that governs God's people, that regulates God's people. He may do certain miracles for them. He may deliver uh, certain things for them, um, um, uh, for their well-being, but also for the advancement of his kingdom and of the advancement of the gospel. And even for the increase and the betterment of the community. So God will deliver some nice miracles and some supplies, you know, uh, for them just so that they can, they can live easily and they can live better, basically, essentially. So where you find yourself, and it does happen, that when you've prayed for something and it doesn't happen, and you pray for another thing and it doesn't happen, and instead things keep piling on and on and on, that's when your faith wanes. That's when your confidence, not just in God, but also your confidence in yourself wanes. And I've got another thing here on the side that I'm just getting now. Um, and I want to say uh, God is whispering to me, but I know I'm talking to rational people, so they don't believe in the supernatural. But actually, I just feel like God must be something that God is whispering uh, to me, right? Is that when you have, when you, so when you are, when your faith is waning and, and God keeps, uh, you know, sort of like is silent when you request. And by the way, that's what I said earlier on. He's not silent. Uh, 
he's been doing something. It's just that is not what you want him to do. Um, and he's been working on something, but it's just it's not at the pace that you would prefer him to do to to work to work on it, right? But then that depresses you, and that challenges your faith, and your faith wanes, and it it starts it starts it starts dying, right? Um, and then and then God delivers you. And this is, proves my first point initially that you're not saved because of the quality of your faith. You're not saved because of the quantity of your faith, you know, because look, your faith is like the good kind, the top quality, top notch kind, or because it's great, it's big, right? In fact, God doesn't even seem obsessed with the quantity of faith. Right. In Jesus, in speaking to his followers, says, you know, only you, all you need is just the faith the size of a mustard seed. Right. Ultimately, all you need is just the faith the size of a mustard seed. See, this God doesn't seem to be in this idea of quantities. Right. Uh, we are the ones who want to quantify faith. But it's like if you have the size, I mean, the faith the size of a mustard seed. I mean, you can say to this mountain, move and the mountain moves. So it's not your faith that moves a mountain, but your con the level of your confidence in the one who moves your mountain. So if you've got this much confidence in God, then God responds with it in, in a manner that moves mountains. I hope that that, 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 make, that makes sense. So ultimately, it seems as though God honors a waning faith. He honors a declining faith. He honors minute faith. He honors, he's aware that our, our confidence in him is, 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 always, is always struggling to grow beyond a certain point. And he honors that, he honors that just a little bit of confidence in him, that little bit of trust in him, that little bit of, it's hard, I'm struggling, I'm suffering, I'm panicking, I'm at my wit's end, but I choose to trust you. That, that, that just on its own, that just on its own, you know, uh, God, God, God seems to, God seems to honor that. So it's not that, it's not when you, you wake up and you're like, hey, yeah, Lord, you know, and you make these screams. And I, again, um, I've got a, an illustration on that. It's not everyone who screams, who screams out of faith. Sometimes even fear, not sometimes, even fear screams. Uh, you know, fear screams as well. So it's not always faith that screams. Not as the fact that you're screaming and shouting and are unable to sleep is not indicative of the fact that you have faith. Fear itself mimics those patterns as well, where you lose sleep, you get insomnia, and you scream when, and you shout when you're praying. You're not shouting because you've got faith. You're shouting because you're afraid. Uh, Lord, help me. And that as wrong as it is, that as inaccurate as it is, God honors it. As small as it is, God honors it. And, and that's just like the one thing, that's not the one thing, but that blows my mind, right? That in reality, right, what I need more than anything is to trust God, not, not to know and not to understand when or how he'll do it. It's just to trust him, right? That's it, that's, I just need to trust him even when it doesn't make sense, right? I just need to trust him. Like just to move with that supernatural conviction that wherever I am is exactly where I'm supposed to be. Again, let me share this. It's just a side note, right? Sidebar. Uh, one of the things that cause us to suffer, um, guys, is that we often, assume, we often think that what's happening is it's when, you, when, it's when you refuse to accept what's happening. See, there needs to be an accept, a level of acceptance with what is happening, right? That I, and so instead of accepting what is happening, you busy obsess, you, you obsess about what should be happening and not immersing yourself in what is happening. I don't want to sound like philosophical here. So that's what causes us to suffer, that you keep fighting with yourself that no, this shouldn't be happening, this shouldn't be happening, but it is happening, right? And you need to reckon with it, okay? So instead of fighting with what is happening, immerse yourself in what is happening, accept it for what it is, right? And let God move you from that position instead of him moving you from a place of denial, still refusing to accept what is happening because you keep obsessing about what should be happening at that particular time. I'll give you an illustration. I've got a five month old daughter, right? And I cycle. I haven't been able to cycle regularly and consistently for months now and it's showing, right? So, um, Every time I, I, I sit with my daughter, she's my daughter, like my child, like my own flesh and blood. I sit with my daughter and I'm, and I'm, and I'm playing with her and she's crying and you know, she's inconsolable. In my head, right, I'm unable, even when she's playing, I'm unable to enjoy her, right, at that time. I'm unable to enjoy her cooing, her smiling, her laughing, her 
grabbing my cheeks. Um, I'm unable to enjoy the process of being a parent. I'm unable to enjoy and to learn her habits. What makes her cry? You know, I'm unable because every time I'm carrying her, I'm thinking, I should be cycling. There's a paper I should be writing. There's a sermon I should be preparing. So I'm not immersing myself in that moment. And so I'm missing out on the lessons and I'm missing out on the experience of that moment simply because I'm busy obsessing and I'm in denial about what is happening. And that causes you to suffer, right? It makes you feel like, hey, yeah, 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 yeah. This, is a, this is a time, this is a waste of time, or this is holding me back, you know? But I mean, it's your, it's your own child, you know? And so, and, and that causes you to suffer. That pleasant experience, causes you to suffer, right? And because you're not present, you're not immersing yourself in it. I hope that illustration was good enough. So when we, when we, when we, so, so when we fail to accept that what is happening, one is what should be happening at that time, but also it is what God has allowed to happen at that time. You see that one is very important that this is what God has allowed to happen at this time, right? And so I must accept it for what it is, right? And listen to this, the Lord has taken. It is the Lord who gives and the Lord has taken. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's, that's Job, right? He's not happy about what is happening, right? It's not to say I'm happy about it. I'm elated about it. I'm accepting it, right? I'm no longer a rich guy. I'm no longer a dad to 10 kids, right? I'm no longer the wealthiest man in the neighborhood, right? It's gone. All right, it's gone. And then he spends the next like almost what 10 chapters because the others are, are speeches from his friends. He spends like chapters exposing his pain and his bitterness about the experience. See, he immerses himself in the experience so that he can lament authentically, truthfully about this, this, this experience. He doesn't gloss over it. He presents it to God as he is and his feelings about it to God as it is, right? Why? Because he's not trying to, he's not trying to be in denial about it. He's accepted it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's the Lord who gives, the Lord has taken, okay. I'm accepting that this is happening. Now let's deal with the ramifications of what is happening. And that's what we do at times, right? Is that we fall into situations, we fall into challenges. We don't accept them for what they are. We are in denial about them and we want to skim over them, right? But, and then they, that, that, and we, we fail to acknowledge the trauma, right? The pain, the bruises that we incur as a result of these experiences because we are so quick to skim over them, right? No, man, no, 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 slow down. Hang on, immerse yourself in that situation. Immerse yourself in your unemployment, not to wallow and feel sorry for yourself. Immerse yourself in it. What does it mean? What is it, how it, what is it saying to you? How does it help you grow? What challenges, what lessons is it bringing for you? But also don't be scared to present it before God. Don't just fall into unemployment and the next thing you're doing, oh Lord, the only thing you ever do is, oh God, give me another job and let it be better than that one. What scars did you incur as a result of this, this experience? And this sometimes, is what God seeks to heal us of, not just to deliver us out of the situation, but also he needs to heal us of going of, of, the, of the scars we incurred as a result of going through that situation. And so there's a lot that like, it's a big, you can tell it's a big fat um, um, a subject, this one, right? Um, but we, we, we tend to scheme it, but God is very thorough about it, you know, he's very intentional about it, and it's all through, all through the Bible, right, and so, um, yeah, so for me, it's, it's, it, ultimately, when you don't trust God anymore, when you find it difficult to trust God, that's when you arrive for the supernatural, because what you, what your, your lack of trust doesn't come from your inability to rationalize God. It comes from your inability to perceive him as a supernatural being. Right? And when that, when that, when your quota for the supernatural has been depleted, you know, then God needs to re replenish it with something supernatural. And I hope you perceive it and you see the supernatural when it happens. Uh, be, and you're not so stuck up on the rational that you miss out on God working in your life in the supernatural. And, and, and this is for me is a very big thing, this idea of the supernatural guys. Because I mean, I've seen it now during the lockdown, right? Or the pandemic, I've seen it in my own life, my own family. And many people will tell you, I'm like 
very rational about faith. Like I'm a very rational creature. I want things to make sense. I want to systematize them. I want to fit them nicely into pockets. But there are things that have been happening during this lockdown that I can't explain, that are inexplicable. And that I'm just like, actually, there's no need for me to find an explanation for them. It's just faith. It's supernatural. It's God being God. And the only place where you experience this is when you're at your wit's end, right? Where you are unable to prescribe anything. You have been like completely exhausted of solutions, right? And where your thoughts end, then God's wisdom begins. Right. Guys, are you still there? Or are you crying? <laughs> we are here. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. Um, should I move on maybe to to the last? Yes. Page? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So I've already now. Let me let me talk about this. This is my conclusion now, right? I've already take, spoken about duration, rationality versus the supernatural entitlement, um, uh, and prescriptions, and then intimidation. Um, you know. By the way, guys, you know when you look at a problem, right, and and you're like, yo, this one is gonna finish me. Have you ever, you know? I mean, this always happens. Oh, my family is gonna suffer as a result of this. Oh, this problem is coming, right? And you wanna act, you wanna do something, you wanna you wanna fiddle, and you wanna just you know put things together, hustle and whatever. And then you ask God on your way to bless your hustle, right? You say, oh Lord, please just bless this thing as I'm doing it because I'm trying to find a way out because I, well you're delaying. So I'm, I've already started helping you. So you you assist me. You know, in the midst of those situations, I'm always reminded of Exodus 14. And like, I'm not being like, I'm not spiritualizing this thing because it is, this is a spiritual thing. So you can't spiritualize what is spiritual already, right? I always go back to Acts chapter, I mean, to, Luke, to Exodus chapter 14, right? There, these guys are in the, in the wilderness, there are mountains on their side. There's an ocean on the other side and there's an Egyptian army uh, uh, behind them pursuing them, right? They've got no way of going forward, no way of going east or west. Um, they've got no way to go, right? Or at their mountains on the side, Egyptian army behind them and the ocean in front of them. And they've got nowhere else to go, right? And they start screaming and they start panicking. See, they start looking for solutions. What can we do? What can we do? And here's God's prescription and here's God's solution to that problem. You be still, right? And I don't know, I think I, I don't know if I went through the call here uh, properly, but I just saw male names. I don't know some of the ladies, I know some of the ladies are watching with the husbands. And this is something we struggle with as men, the idea of stillness, just the idea of stopping and be still, just for, not for long, just for a few moments, just to re get, recollect yourself, gather yourself and allow God right, to lead you. And in that process, maybe of stillness, then God intervenes, okay? I promise you, if you're honest with yourself, you will realize that in acting prematurely and in acting out of panic, you have actually caused more problems for yourself than the problem you were trying to solve, right? So things done out of desperation have led to more problems than the ones you were trying to solve initially. And here's God's solution. You be still and I'll fight for you. Just be, just be still, just pause for a moment. Reflect, recollect yourself, immerse yourself in the situation, allow it to be what it is, and then just get out of it and allow God to lead you to your next step. Um, and, and, I, and I say this as a father, husband, I'm a father of two now, as a husband for nine years, uh, as a son for like my whole life, and as a man, basically for for for, for most of my life, is that it's just it's, it's important for for us as men to just chill, just be still. Can't always be like Liverpool, counter attack after counter attack, high tempo and high octane football all the time. Just relax, right? Catch your breath. That's why Liverpool players are always getting injured. High octane, always, 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 always. And by the way, Klopp had the same problem in at Borussia Dortmund. High octane transitional soccer counter attack, attacking football, it causes more injuries. People get injured. Now Van Dijk is injured, right? I'm not a Liverpool fan, by the way. So you can't always be like high octane, high. Just be still. And, and the Bible says it very clearly: be still, and the Lord will fight for you. At times, put your ego aside and this need to always fix things aside and surrender. 
to someone greater than you, right? Who is God and let him fight for you. Just surrender. Let's just see what would happen if you surrendered, all right? Just see what would happen if you surrendered, completely surrendered to God and say, Lord, uh, please take over. And let me end with this thought with you. Pain, problems, challenges, issues uh, don't occur in a vacuum. They come from somewhere. Dare I say they come from someone, right? There's a person, there's an individual, there's an entity, there's a being that creates this problem. Problems, of course, it's the devil, all right? It's the devil. He creates these problems. And of course, if the problems have a source, then they must have an intention. They must have an agenda, right? So not all the problems you face, and let me not say not all, in fact, none of the problems you face come from God. They come from the devil. It just so happens that God hijacks these plans and brings out good out of them, but they don't come from God with a purpose of making you strong or making you a better person. They come from the devil and they have an agenda. They're interested. So the devil wants to use these problems to do to you the very opposite thing that God intends to do with you. I hope I'm making sense there. So the devil uses these challenges to do with you and to achieve in you the very opposite thing that God is trying to work in you. When people make viruses, these guys make viruses to destroy humans. They have to study the human body and how it functions. They have to get acquainted with the human, human physiology uh, in order to create a virus that's going to destroy it and kill the body you know, in a very efficient manner. That's what the devil does. He needs to get acquainted with you. Uh, we get, get a, a familiar with you so that when it's time to destroy you, he does it in a very effective and efficient manner. And that's why some of the problems you go through feel so personal and they feel so real and they feel so hard. It's because they're designed, tailored, designed to fit who we are because we have been studied by their creator. But behind the creator of the problem is the creator of the ones who are in the problem and that's us. So God will never allow the devil to have the last say in as far as we are concerned. So at times when we allow ourselves to get swept away by the problem, or we allow the problem and the challenge to do in us what the enemy decides and intends for it to do in us, which is the exact opposite of what God wants to do with us, i.e., which is having us lose trust and confidence in God. When we allow that to happen, then the enemy has won. And so in every situation, in every problem, in every challenge, the one way out or the one way to victory is not a solution to the problem. It's not what we need more than anything, but an unwavering trust in God, which is what the devil is trying to whittle down and to do away with. And so this trust needs to be defined. This trust needs to be irrational. This trust needs to be born out of surrender. This trust needs to withstand intimidation. But most importantly, this trust needs to be durable. It needs to outlast the length of the problem that you are in. And so when we trust in God, we are actually saying to the devil, no matter what you throw our way, no matter how hard you light the fires, we choose to remain in God's hand though you think we are in your hand. And I promise you, when our trust is on God's ability to deliver, he will deliver. Let me say this. Is it not possible that when we have not been delivered, it's not because God hasn't delivered, but because we abandoned the post at which the deliverance was situated and located in search of our own deliverance. Can I say that again? Sometimes it's not that God hasn't delivered us, it's that we left the post at, where, at which our delivery and our deliverance was located in search of our own deliverance. That's a lack of trust. Trust God, even when it doesn't make sense. Trust God, even when it hurts. Trust God, even when it humbles you to a level you are uncomfortable with. Trust God longer than your problems. Let your trust be in this truth that he who has begun a good work in you will not stop and will not cease until he has brought it unto, into completion 
let your trust be in God and not in your ability to trust God. May God bless you all. Amen. All right, no thanks, uh, uh, Fundisi, for that. Uh, let's see, is there anyone with a question? Any questions, guys? Yeah, I see a lot of amens, Fundisi, so it means people were blessed. Thank you so much for your time. And, uh, and, 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 and the ending note to say, we must just trust in the Lord mm. and, um, and everything will be fine. This COVID has been real for, for, for most of us. Mm. And uh, it, it, it has taken all of us by surprise. We were not, um, actually we we're claiming that this is our year at the beginning of the year. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> plenty plenty i know man exactly so and the, and the and uh, something beyond our imaginations has happened mm. and the, and and during this time some families have grown closer while others mm. have grown apart you know um mm. so in all of mm. this i think i think the the, the 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 key message that i'm getting is that we we must just trust in the lord he's still in control mm. Um, <clears throat> we don't know what's going to happen next month, next year. Yeah. Uh, because if we were to, if we were to try and anticipate, it will just be digging ourselves into a yeah a very serious yeah. hole that we can't get out of. Yeah. So no yeah. thanks for for the message. I think there are no no questions. I think on that note, um, we we can. Do you have any closing remarks for us? And then we can pray. Oh, I've, I've shot with all my bullets that I brought today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Um, I think, uh, I think let's, let's pray. Okay. Uh, maybe pray for us and finish. Okay, let me pray. Let me pray. Sure. Um, dearest Father in heaven, thank you once again for this wonderful, wonderful moment. Just a fellowship and discussion um, with you. Um, and about you. Um, we are struggling, Lord, with so many challenges and issues. Um, none of us were prepared for what's happened this year and the ramifications of what has been going on. And we know that this is not the end. In fact, some even uh, speculate that this could just be the beginning of a very long and odious hard time ahead. And so, dear Father, during this time, as complicated, unprecedented as it has been, we choose to trust you. We trust you complicitly with no reservation. We trust you um, even though everything against us refuses to trust in you. We trust you, dear Father, even when nothing about trusting you makes sense at this time. And so, dear Lord, I pray that you don't allow our entitlement, our rationality, you don't allow our lack of faith um, to abandon and to let go of you, that when we can no longer hold on to you, dear Father, that you may hold on to us and clasp us in within the palm and the hull of your hand, dear Lord. Don't allow us to fall by the wayside. Let me pray a blessing, oh dear Father, on each and every single family that is present and represented here on this call. Be with them, oh dear Father. Be Guide their footsteps. Lead them, oh dear Lord, in whatever and everything that they do be with their going out and their coming in. When they go out to oh dear Father, may you go before them, clearing the way and the path, removing any dangers and obstacles that may endanger not just their lives, but their spiritual connection to you. I pray, dear Father, that you'll also be with their coming back, or oh dear Father, into their homes. Be with every single corner of their houses. Cleanse it and clear it of any unbecoming and unnatural spirits, or oh dear Father, unnatural moods and attitudes, unnatural ill illnesses and ailments, or oh dear Father, that may be resident in their homes. 
let your spirit fill their dwelling places, oh dear Lord, so that nothing can find room within their homes, oh dear Father. I pray, oh dear Lord, that you may be with the work of their hands. May you use their hands, oh dear Father, that whatever they touch may multiply, that whatever they do, oh dear Father, may bring life, that whatever they say might edify, oh dear Father. I pray, oh dear Lord, that you may be with their resources. I pray, oh dear Father, that you may replenish their bank accounts, you may replenish their finances, that you may replenish replenish their material needs, oh dear Father. I pray, oh dear Lord, that they may dwell in, in, in environments and live lives of abundance, oh dear Father, but only if this abundance will not, uh, will not cut them away from you, oh dear Father. I pray, dear Lord, that you will be with their families. Regenerate love between couples, oh dear Father, that they may love each other more than they've ever done before. That the years spent together may not see the depletion of their love and commitment to one another, but instead, oh dear Father, may see and them, oh dear God, discovering new ways of loving each other to love each other based on the experiences they've shared with, we, with one another. Draw them with cords of loving kindness. Be with their children. Protect them from temptations. Protect them uh, from illnesses. Protect them from harm, dear Father. Uh, help them, oh dear Lord, to, to remember the lessons taught to them by their parents. And I pray, oh dear Father, that you may blind them to, to the faults of their parents and only open their eyes and ears to the good things that will draw them closer to you, oh dear Father. I pray for Blessed Hope Seventh-day Adventist Church, oh dear Lord, that it may indeed be a city on a hill that will bring hope to its residents, oh dear Lord, and, then, and those that are in its surrounds, that it may be a house that is known as a refuge for those who are in need, that it may be known as a house uh, where bondages are broken, oh dear Father, for those who are oppressed and suppressed. I pray, oh dear Lord, that you will hear this prayer, dear Father, simply because it is a prayer that desires that we have our lives and our houses in order so that we can be of good use to you. We pray all these things are because we are worthy, but we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. 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 All right. Now, amen. thank you so much, Mfundisi. Um, we, we really needed this weekend. And we thank you for accepting our invitation. And uh, I think officially you are the friend of uh, Voice of Hope Church. So are you only making that official on... now? Oh, I'm <laughs> late. <man. laughs> Yeah. All right. No, thank you so much and blessings to you and your family. Thank and you. Pass our regards. All right. We'll do, my elder. Thank okay. you, man. Thank you so much, guys. Love you all. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.